Hey, good morning, good afternoon team. This is Brett Lenmark. I'm a product marketing manager here at Silence. I'm located in Portland, Oregon, but last week uh, Richard and I spent the entire week in uh, uh, the city that has no memory, Las Vegas, Nevada, at uh, AWS reInvent. And we've got some exciting new news. New news is the best kind of news uh, to share with you here today. Uh, before that, we're going to set the stage and give you a little context as to why Silence is uh, uh, taking this interesting road to supporting uh, AWS EC2 and beyond instances. So with that, the most important thing I'm going to impart to you today is those first letters under Silence, Brett Lundmark. Our email nomenclature here is first initial last name at silence.com. Usually the best questions happen in about two days where they're like, what do Lundmark say about EC2 and how to apply? So uh, in short, the message is uh, my email message uh, nomenclature is blenmark. That's like Denmark with an L at silence.com. If I don't know it, I've got an army of folk behind me, including Richard, who uh, will, will steer me back on path. He's been my uh, technical counterpart here moving forward. Uh, just as by way of introduction, I do positioning, messaging, and enablement here at Silence for uh, Protect and our optics product, which is our EDR product. Never written, a, well, I've, last time I wrote a line of code was 1984 in BASIC. So uh, yeah, that, that'll let you know what, my ego is not tied to what we're doing here, but uh, Rich has got the other side of that coin here handled adeptly. So with that, let's jump in. We've only got half an hour with you here today. The idea behind today is to give you a little context as to what we're doing and what we're doing moving forward. And then we'll have uh, some pretty pointed uh, announcements toward the end, but we'll be brief. So with that, feel free to leverage the uh, Q&A chat session. I'll do my best to answer questions. If something come up, comes up later, I'm at your service as well. So let's talk a little bit about why we're, we're doing what we're doing. I like to take a known commodity and move to uh, something that may be unknown to you. But for those of you who attended AWS, you already died in the wool. You know why we're moving to uh, uh, a cloud-based type of a storage environment. But for those of you who are like me that like analogies, think about pizza. There's many ways to consume pizza. You can, uh, you know, back in the day, you can make it at home whereby you provide all the infrastructure, all the ingredients, all the atmosphere, and you eat your pizza. Uh, but moving and moving forward, there has been other options to uh, get a pizza to have your family consume it. You could go and get a take and bake, whereby you provide some of the infrastructure and a restaurant provides the dough, the sauce, the toppings, the cheese. They wrap it up and put it on a piece of cardboard and you bake it in your own oven. You provide your chairs and if you're like me, you'll watch the, the game and, and consume your pizza that way. Uh, if you're even lazier, I guess is one way to put it, you can have delivery. The only thing you need to provide is a table and chairs. These are the self-managed element. I guess an appetite and a mouth would be third and fourth, but uh, your delivery place would, uh, would offer all these pieces in green here. Vendor managed is, is the way to put it. And the last, if you uh, are really hungry and uh, you want a full service, full meal deal, you obviously go to the pizza parlor and get it uh, in that manner. The idea here is the black indicates what you provide, the green indicates what the pizza service would provide. So moving forward, if you look at how you consume software, there's uh, definite correlations there too, and different, uh, definite uh, choices that you make as a consumer, each with their own trade-off, but they all correlate to the is this self-managed or is this vendor provided? So uh, traditionally you would buy software and you would manage it, you would uh, run the OS, that would be up to you to patch and such. Uh, obviously you'd buy the storage and the networking you, you would apply uh, and, and purchase yourself. Moving forward as we go to more of a cloud environment, uh, you would have your infrastructure as a service uh, and then you would uh, be responsible for even less of that. Um, moving forward in the current uh, day and age, I guess, to coin a term, you, in, in software as a service, you are actually employing someone like AWS or Azure or, or the cloud supplier uh, of your choice to provide the entire uh, full meal deal for you. So very strong correlation there uh, with the idea being some you manage, some you don't, and it's a function of what uh, meets your requirements, what you're prepared to, to offer. And it also has some uh, advantages and, and drawbacks that I'll, I'll, I'll offer here on a very high level. 
again, recognizing that the reason you're on this call is you're probably employing a cloud infrastructure to understand this. So trying to be brief, uh, you know, a traditional data center has the, uh, the obvious advantage of being well-known, secure, stable. The downside is the utilization can be um, uh, oftentimes challenging. And let, let me tell you what I mean by that. I had a friend who I was hoping to cycle with. He's one of those guys who runs literally 100 miles at a time uh, for a long weekend. Uh, and that's his idea of enjoyment. If you had one look at me, you'd recognize we don't share that. But I was hoping to cycle with him. And he said, well, I'd like to come biking with you, but I'm really struggling with my magic space. And I, I hadn't heard that term before. And I paused, hey, help me understand what's going on. Maybe I can help. And he says, yeah, well, in, in my company, typically we do budget cycles about every six months. What happens is we get tops down requests for storage, and then we budget, we buy it, and we allocate it. And it either gets used or it doesn't. The, the storage that doesn't get used is called that magic space because it was allocated and purchased, but either the project didn't come through or the, t the team went away or we outsourced it. And now it's spare capacity. So that's that utilization number you see there in tr traditional data center. Moving forward, the virtualized data center, you get higher utilization rates uh, and your management costs decrease. And then moving forward to, the, to what are here, we're here to uh, discuss today, the on-prem or the off-prem pieces uh, are, are the big data trend movers that, that we're finding with the evolution of the data center. Now, the challenge with that as, as we talked about last, if, if you were, if you uh, visited our booth last week in Las Vegas at AWS reInvent, is that people assume security when things are in the cloud. And if you, um, here's a, <laughs> showing what you've seen if you were at, at last week, we did uh, Thomas Pernicchiaro, who by the way is a sneak peek. He'll be uh, the featured speaker in, in our next discussion, which is uh, about the middle of January. I'll, uh, and we'll refer to hit that in the close of the, uh, the discussion here. But the point of that, of that whole dissertation is this. When you use the cloud, you have, you uh, by definition, employ a shared security model. And on the whole, the fine print here is, is where the details are. Uh, if you use, for example, AWS, they, have, they provide what they call security of the cloud. That has to do with, you know, obviously the physical security. They have their data centers behind lock and key. Uh, there's a man with a large caliber weapon on his side that won't let anyone walk into the data center. Uh, also the access credentials, things like that you would expect. Uh, however, what people are learning is that the responsibility of the product or the, the parts in the cloud is the responsibility of the customer. And let me give you an overly simplistic example of what that means. If you were, an example, throw in a, an Excel sheet up in uh, an AWS instance, which is you know, a, a pretty common usage model. It's a great place to store data. If there is a, a macro embedded in that uh, Excel spreadsheet that says at three o'clock in the morning, start exfiltrating data to a third country using a storage system like Dropbox that is non-standard with escalated privileges, that is responsibility of the customer. So the question then becomes, who best provides security uh, for data that is in the cloud? So with that, I'm going to uh, shift the presentation over now that I've planted that question in your mind to Richard, uh, who's going to walk you through a quick understanding of the silence approach to protecting data in the cloud. As you guys know, we have a, a number of distributions that we support, uh, specifically on the AWS side, um, as well in, as in other cloud environments like Azure. So if you're looking uh, to run any flavor of Linux or uh, variant of hosts that are out there, um, we most likely have an agent that will support those. Uh, so kind of running through uh, from the top of my head before I, I jump into uh, the Amazon Linux side specifically, we have Red Hat 6 and 7, as well as CentOS 6 and 7. Uh, we are working with Red Hat right now uh, to be included with the launch of Red Hat 8. Uh, we also support Ubuntu 1404, 1604, and are releasing support for 18.04 this month. Uh, we have support uh, coming
coming out this month for Amazon Linux uh, version one, specifically uh, 2017.09 and 2018.03 versions. Uh, we also have support for Amazon Linux 2. And we are currently in development effort for SUSE version 12 uh, with a scheduled beta drop for that in February. Uh, so given all of those different flavors, our goal is to provide uh, kind of the, the cross distro support for any type of variant that customers want to run. Now, Richard, in, just so I'm just so I'm uh, understanding you properly, it sounds like we've had flavors of Linux for quite some time, meaning you can apply the silent security approach to your typical Linux, which are obviously typically servers. Uh, but what I'm hearing now is we're able to apply uh, the silence protect protection uh, to servers that reside at AWS using AWS Linux, or did I miss that? Yeah, that, that's 100% correct. So we've we've had customers uh, for a little over a year now actually running uh, Red Red Hat, uh, Ubuntu, and uh, Windows hosts within AWS. So uh, we we have the agents available and now we're really making that push to expand upon that to add additional uh, distro support for customers. Uh, so with, with that, um, there are multiple ways that you can deploy our agent into those images. Um, so two kind of top level ways uh, to bring up here are one, you can pre-bake the image into an, your AMI. Um, so essentially, you'll have our agent uh, installed in sort of a, a master image. And then when you go to spin up hosts, you'll spin them up off of that master image with the agent. Um, the second method is if you use some sort of automation tool, such as uh, Chef, or Ansible or Puppet, uh, and with those, you can actually automate the deployment of our agent as well as the configuration file um, that will contain uh, different configuration settings as well as your installation token. Uh, so those are the two primary methods uh, that customers today, uh, as well as ourselves in internally, use to run the agent or install them within host environment. So. Uh, just doing a quick run through of Amazon Linux here. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have an RPM for Amazon Linux. Now, when you go to run an install on Amazon Linux, and it's very similar to Red Hat, Pentos, um, those other distros, you're going to set up a configuration file that contains your token. Um, as well as other information that are uh, specific that you, you want to set up, like your self-protection zone. The one key item that I want to call out here is this Amazon instance ID. So if you're running an AWS uh, host, and I understand that IP and host name are definitely not ideal for managing those hosts, um, or even doing uh, kind of like a compliance check to make sure you have it. Uh, security solution installed on those folks. We have the ability, uh, as long as you use the AWS equals one token within that configuration file to capture the instance ID. We concatenate that instance ID to our, uh, our silence device name field. So that device name field, if you're interested in using our API, you can then call in and either manage those hosts, or as you terminate hosts on your AWS side, you can call in and have those hosts deleted from uh, our management console so that it, it doesn't create a uh, laundry list of uh, offline or un unoperative uh, devices within our management console. So th those are kind of the, the key areas that I wanted to touch upon. With this, uh, Amazon Linux uh, version one and two are releasing this month, uh, and 
we we have a, a pretty significant footprint on that site already. So it's it's exciting to to see the expansion that we're making on on the Linux side. That's really great news, Richard. I appreciate the update. I know you've been working very hard to make this a seamless, uh, but not compromise the protection. And if if last week was any indication of the excitement in the marketplace, then uh, uh, good things were to come. So congratulations on the milestone. Uh, just telling, um, re repeating, or I think the release comes in about a week or so, uh, looking at the calendar here. So we'll have the agent available in, in about a week. So really good stuff. Great. Well, with that, um, gosh, Shirley, let's open it up to any questions that may have occurred in the, in the short term. I know we've had a pretty broad, high-level discussion of what we have to offer here, knowing that we'll be going deeper next month in uh, the protect, pr protection mechanism. But uh, anything pop up that I can address before we dismiss the team here? Absolutely. Um, I did have one question that came up, and that is, what are the differences between silent security and a typical traditional approach? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. In fact, that was usually the, the lead question we'd have yesterday because people um, don't really know that there's an option beyond a traditional signature approach. So, and that's really the reason I'm here is when I learned what silence was doing a couple of years ago with artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, it caused me to want to work here. <laughs> so let me share a little bit about that, knowing that we've only got a few minutes here. So uh, back in the day, um, before we even had things like the cloud or mobile or kiosks or that type of thing, um, we were typically looking at a server and client type of an arrangement. And it was pretty easy to understand how viruses would affect and how they would transmit and what they would do. And part of the reason was, was that we didn't have a lot of options as far as how we access our data. We weren't looking at mobile, we weren't looking at cloud, uh, we weren't looking at those type of things. It was typically server to, to client or endpoint, you're, you're typically your PC node or your Mac node mode. So that obviously changed. The other thing that changed was the simple number of threats and the nature of the threats that, that occur. And without going in too deep of a dissertation, um, really what happened is it went from a hey let's write a virus to stick it to the man as i'm walking out the door it's my last day here i didn't like working here and i'm going to erase all the data uh to more of a money-making scheme as we've seen with you know ransomware and viruses that uh exfiltrate money and and data that's obviously the the, the lifeblood blood of companies and lately as as obviously anyone who's been following security know it, it knows it, it is a uh it, it can be a quasi-governmental type disruptor, whereby um, I think it was 2011, the federal government identified uh, cyber as the next warfare uh, uh, field. So you air, sea, land, and uh, cyber. So uh, those two things change, how we access our data and the number of, uh, uh, of ways and the number of variants we have. And really what I found with the variant number is it's not that hackers are, are extremely creative and sit down in the morning and write a brand new variant, but it's very easy to take an existing piece of malware and tweak it marginally and create what they call a zero day threat, something that doesn't have a signature against it. So when the founders of Silence got together, it was based on that premise is how do we, how do we provide a protection mechanism that doesn't rely on historical signatures or what this thing looks like in the past. And what they determined with the advent of cloud computing is that if you ask enough questions of the portable executable file, for example, how big are you? Uh, what packer were you used? Uh, does this make sense as it relates to the function of the, uh, of the line of code versus what it's actually doing? And any number of those, I believe there's about seven and a half million things you can take a look at in each PE file and combinations thereof. Of those, about three and a half or four are indicative of safety, rectitude, or danger. And they determined that if they were to ask enough questions, as back when you took uh, statistics one on one, you can make a, a very confident judgment as to is this PE file safe or not to run. That's really the secret sauce behind Silent's approach is. We take a look at those, we ask enough questions of the file, and we make a judgment based upon that with very high confidence as to if this is safe to run or not. So I know that was a bit of a long-winded ex example, but I'm very passionate about what we do and how we do it, and wanted to get some insights from this marketing guy's perspective as to uh, 
how we're different. So Shirley, any any other questions? And by the way, if uh, if you want to dive deeper, that's what I love to talk about. On top of that, I've got an army of folks behind me who are very passionate about talking about the details. That reach out to me and happy to uh, to, to set up a call with you discreetly. Shirley, any other questions? A question yeah, yeah. did come up is. Is there any type of solution brief or any type of materials that I can share with my colleagues regarding silence and cloud security? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is there's two that I would guide you to. One is oriented toward our product, and it talks about, uh, it's basically a synopsis of what I just offered, it talks about what is happening with the industry, why the shared security model is so important, and what silence is doing about it. But also, we've got a lot of experience on our on, on our services side of the coin that does uh, that would become relevant to someone who says, "Okay, I get this. I don't know how, and I don't have time to learn. I'd like to employ someone who knows about it." And uh, silence, you came to mind as as the expert in the field. So, two of them: one is a product, and two is a, uh, a, a services solution brief. Surely, I'll I'll reach out to you, or I'll rely on you. That is for. Uh, Perhaps you could tuck that in as a as a follow up to this discussion. Anyone who's good enough to give me half an hour of the morning certainly uh, could find value in that. Absolutely, thank you um, for your time. I, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. And uh, Richard, Brett, do you have any closing comments before I wrap up? Well, I hope to see you uh, next year at reInvent. It also looks like Amazon's doubling down on security with another show in, in Atlanta coming up in, I think, uh, April or May. So uh, please, if there's something I can offer you in the interim, I'm at your service. It's B Lenmark, like Denmark with an L, B like boy, Lenmark, like Denmark with an L, at silence.com. I'm at your service, and I want to help. If there's something I can offer you, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you all for joining us today and spending time with us, and thank you, Brett and Richard. We will be sending out the cloud solutions brief that Brett mentioned, and I also want to give you a heads up and join us on our next cloud security webinar that has taken place on January 17th in 2019. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, everyone.